This is a production of Cornell University. So uh, I think Adrian actually did a really nice job introducing what my group does, um, just to put it in, in my own more mechanical engineering perspective. Um, so we're all about connecting structure to function in polymers. Uh, originally, that was mostly looking at mechanical properties. So like my absolute favorite thing to do is tension test, which is pulling something until it fails. Um, been my favorite since, since undergrad. Um, and, uh, but, but we um, do lots of other types of things to try to understand polymers. So um, in addition to not just tension testing, we do a lot of other types of experiments. Um, my core training is really in continuum mechanics, which is trying to come up with like a thermodynamically consistent framework to describe materials and where their properties are governed by. And we also uh, have diverge into many other type techniques, like we actually make our own polymers and uh, we also run atomistic simulations. So we're kind of like whatever we need to do to answer the question that we care about. That's that's what our, my lab does. Um, and I'm gonna talk today a lot about our work that's at the um, tailoring at the atomic scale or at the molecular scale. Uh, but we also do work where the structure that we're interested in controlling is sort of tens or hundreds of nanometers or micrometers or even, even millimeter scales. So um, we're, I guess, size scale agnostic, although I found it pretty work, fun working with chemistry and chemists, and I hope I'll find the same thing for biology. Uh, although I'm a little bit intimidated by how uncontrolled biology is. Just be honest about that. Okay. So I'm gonna to talk today first about the Engineered Living Materials Institute and then uh, about some of our own research. And please, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. I definitely don't care whether I make it through all the slides. I'd rather uh, you, you understand me um, and be excited about what I'm talking about. All right, so engineered living materials is a field that involves materials that either are living, used to be living, or were made by living materials. Some people will define it only as the first one, but I, I like this more inclusive definition and the, the engineering part for us uh, means we're not just like growing a tree and letting it grow. However, um, we, we're trying to manipulate it to serve the function that we want it to serve. And so that could be uh, synthetic biology type engineering or actual genetic engineering. It could be um, growing different organisms together so that they have feedback on each other, or it could be um, like engineering sort of synthetic inputs to the system to manipulate. Uh, growth and function. And um, lots of reasons I'm excited about this. Uh, the main one that I see, I guess maybe, maybe name two, is that the way that we are like, have our society right now is not very sustainable. I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room who thinks that. And especially if you look at our civil infrastructure right now, it's starting to fall apart. It's actually survived like way longer than it was designed for, but still it's falling apart. If we want to replace those those structures. That's a huge greenhouse gas emission. It's also a huge like financial cost. And as things crumble and fall, they're not like being reused for something, right? So that's all waste product. Um, and so my idea is, can we use biology? Not just my idea. Many people have this idea, right? Can we use uh, what biology is great at to um, like do things better the second time around, to perhaps repair the existing things? Um, I'm a, I'm a polymer person, so I reluctantly put the second dramatic bullet point up here. Um, but that is this uh, fun fun fact from a DOE report that uh, we're supposed to end up with like more plastic mass than fish in the ocean by 2050. And I'm sure like you've all seen the horrifying gatherings of plastic in the ocean, which is only really the surface problem. Um, and so a lot of the materials that we're working with, including my favorite polymers, um, they, they end up as waste products. And so there's tons of like disposable, consumable polymer products that we could maybe think about replacing with things that are not disposable and consumable, or if they are disposed, uh, you know, degrade in a, in a more friendly manner. So this is the first part, like, let's think about doing things better on earth. And the second part, which Adrian mentioned, is um, also as we move to um, building habitats like on the moon and on Mars, like we need to also think strategically about how we're doing that. And so, you know, NASA and Space Force are both really pushing for this, for sort of um, building permanent habitats. 
Um, and if you're going to do something like that, you need to minimize the mass you're bringing with you and use in situ resources. Um, and you also want to take techniques, bring, bring materials that um, have adaptable function. So if I could bring like lipolized bacteria or spores, right, or seeds with me and then grow them on demand into what I need, that's much more flexible than like, I don't know, bringing a, a house that I assemble and then it just is a house and it's always a house. And if I didn't remember to bring my microwave, I'm in trouble. Right? Probably I'm not bringing a microwave, but like you want to uh, have a set of materials or a set of tools where you can make what you need what you need as you need it and recycle it and make it into something else the second time. I'm, I'm using the word recycle, but don't picture the current recycling plants where we don't actually use them. Um, yeah. Everything just gets stored in a, in a building and never actually recycled. And the, the last piece of this um, that I'm really excited about is enhancing the functionality of materials. I, you know, I think this is something that uh, from a synthetic material perspective we've been working towards, but traditionally like we make uh, a structural a structure around us, it serves a mechanical function. Maybe it also serves a thermal insulation function, but we wanna have materials that convert energy, protect us from uh, cold weather when it's cold, adapt so that it doesn't protect us from cold weather when it's not cold, right? And that um, serve many, many purposes at once. And I think that's something that biology is, is very good at. And I'm sure I'm like speaking, speaking to people who know that better than I do. So uh, because of all those things, um, I've been working on, on building this Engineered Living Materials Institute, which is a collaborative hub on campus. And our goal is basic science and technology development. And as we were discussing this over the last year, I think what we really said is education also needs to be a central part of this because we need to build the team of people who can actually work on this. And there's a lot of uh, language to overcome to even have a conversation about, about science that crosses um, biology and engineering and social science. Um, and so as I think Adrian, uh, the same phrase I did, so we're interested in materials built of and or by engineered non-mammalian living organisms. And I'm really emphasizing this is not a, a biomedical type effort. This is a like all the world around us type effort. And we're focused on um, thinking about tech, like wearable technologies that are sort of for the individual uh, building um, habitats, say where we're controlling the environment in a lava tube on, on Mars so that it's now breathable and, um, and, and thinking about how do we build new colonies either um, on Earth in places that were previously not habitable um, or um, uh, in, in space. And the reason we're doing this here is because Cordell has like all the expertise we need to take on this challenge. Uh, there's so many like awesome young faculty working in synthetic biology and uh, really great expertise in, in plant biology and microbiology and like yeast, right? Like we and we have like great material science and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and like we just need to, to bring it together. So you are excited about changing the world. I know everybody's excited about changing the world. If you're excited about changing the world in this way, um, could uh Join our, join our team. So this is these were our, our founding members that have been meeting over the last, uh, mostly since January, but a little bit last fall as well, to, to build this vision together. Um, and of course, I highlighted uh, Laura, Maria, and plant people. Okay. Um, so if you're interested, please send me an email, or you could join our uh, journal club, which Trevor is leading next week. One of our only postdocs. Um, we could help you with a postdoc fellowship application, one of Cornell's sources or external. And um, if you think like you have a research project that's interested, I'd like love to work with you or, or talk to you about other people that would like to work with you or if you're interested in getting involved in one of our projects. Um, we're definitely aggressively writing proposals. So um, yeah, and that's it. Do people wanna ask questions about this? Or? They teach us in our teaching engineering classes that we're supposed to wait an awkward amount of time before we move on. But have I reached it? Okay, yes, I've reached it. <laughs> All right, I'm so happy to talk about something um, hopefully more tangible, um, which is a uh, work for my own group. I tried to pick out two like sub projects that I think you'll appreciate, but we'll find out. All right, so the first is looking at 
uh, force sensitive molecules and we've been um, looking at these as a way to probe forces in polymers and try to understand better what's going on within polymers. I'm gonna talk about our work specifically on glassy polymers, which is are like acrylic or, or uh, polycarbonate, like safety, safety glass type materials, um, because there's a lot less known about those um, scientifically. And uh, so this is mostly going to show the work of my uh, PhD student, Stephen Yang, a former post and former postdoc, Steve Aldadowski, and, and Jay Wu Kim. And we've worked with um, Jeff Coates' lab at, at, in Cornell Chemistry Department. He's just a phenomenal polymer chemist. Um, and the uh, Charles Deason Duck group at the Technion, whom we actually postdoc together, um, also a phenomenal chemist. So I've been really lucky to have some great chemistry collaborators. Okay. So when I think about mechanochemistry, or these are really, we call these mechanopores, molecules where the chemistry is driven by mechanics. I like to uh, draw the like classic school this pixel, right? Energy diagram. But okay, I've lost track of when you learn things. So if I think about um, a, a, this molecule, I think about like a reactant and a product. And usually if I want to go from a reactant to a product, I give it like heat or maybe I have a light driven reaction. Um, but in this sense, in this, in this system, we're looking at using mechanics to drive from um, a closed state to an open state, or basically I'm using force to break a bond. Hopefully there's something very intuitive about using force to break a bond. Uh, in this mechanochemistry field, we're like doing it on purpose, not just accidentally breaking things and hopefully to add functionality to our materials. So, um, in, in most of these systems, when we apply force, we are lowering the energy barrier to get to the open state, and we're also shifting the equilibrium so that the open state is, is preferred. Um, and so you can think about this in equilibrium states, you can think about these in terms of, of reaction coordinates. And this field started um, really thinking about covalent bonds and weak covalent bonds. Um, but uh, there's sort of a, a broader interpretation now of using more dynamic bonding. If you go all the way down to sort of lower hydrogen bonding and from like Van der Waals interactions, the, it sort of loses its meaning because these are so dynamic that your shift in equilibrium that you get from having force applied is not terribly impactful. So we're, we're typically up at sort of stronger binding energy. And um, the first like really big paper in this field is out of the Autonomous Material Systems Group at Illinois. And they use this really cool mechanophore called Spiroparan. It actually came from um, transition lens technology. So this is a molecule that is known to be uh, light responsive. Um, but what they found is that if you attach your mechanophore or your molecule um, to your to a polymer chain on a, at the proper side sites, basically you want to go across this molecule. What you could do is uh, break this this uh, carbon oxygen bond, and you get a different form of the molecule that is now colored and fluorescent. And what color it turns into depends on on what polymer you put it into. But like purple, if you see any purple, red, or uh, blue on this screen, that's that's the molecule changing. And they put this originally into, into two polymers, one elastomeric like rubber band type material and one, one glassy material. Um, and so this is um, the active system where this is properly connected and this is a control system where it's not properly connected. This is polymethacrylate, which is very stretchy, especially if you pull slowly. Um, so here you can see this like as they're pulling, so they're going to a strain of 10, which means it's 10 times longer than it was originally. 11 times longer. Um, and so this is very, very stretchy. And when you go all that way, you start to actually activate this molecule because you are putting enough force across it to break this bond. And then when you, um, when this material fails, it recovers, it's actually a nice dark red because now it has less area, but this is the idea. Um, I actually saw this presented twice in grad school, but the first one was very early on. The second time I was like getting ready to graduate and I was like, I need to go model this. So uh, I got myself a postdoc fellowship so I couldn't work with this group at Omnis. So I just thought this was like such an awesome technique. Um, there's been a ton of work on other mechanophores since then, and also a ton of work with people putting spire brand into like every polymer imaginable. Um, so I, I originally made like several slides of this and then cut down to just one. 
Um, so this is uh, a light emitting molecule. This is out of uh, Rinse of Business Group at Eindhoven. And what's nice about this is, um, so when it breaks, it emits light, which means you have like an instantaneous measure of force on the polymer chains, as opposed to the spark, which is more of like an accumulative measure. Um, but this one is non-reversible. So once it breaks, you're like separated and you're, you're done. Um, and uh, this, this third one is like a, there's many versions of it, but this is out of uh, Stefan Craig's group down at Duke. And they started by doing this conversion that gives you a longer polymer chain. So you're like unwrapping this to give you more length. And so if you put lots of those along a polymer, you can have a huge amount of like stress relief. So you're like pulling something and it's gonna break. And then instead of the whole thing breaking, it like gradually unfolds. So I always think of this as like the, the Titan of the synthetic polymer world. Is it the right community to talk about Titan? Crap. You guys should learn about Titan. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's a muscle protein that uh has this really cool like sacrificial <laughs> bond breaking and un unfolding so you can like stretch it like insane amounts and um it's, it's okay that's too human so um so they did this thing with unfolding but then they also were able to actually drive cross-linking so this becomes a reactive site and if you put a cross-linker in there you can um actually end up with a material that's like stiffer and tougher than you started with so you do what seems to be destroying the material, you end up with something better. Uh, this is a, a system that I collaborated on uh, right around when I was starting here um, with a, a group that's a, like bio, somewhere between biology and, and chemistry and material science. And in this system, we're using disulfide bonds, which are like a pretty weak covalent bond and reversible bond. Um, so. We're, we're breaking those by doing uh, compression on these polymers. And um, what that does is give you an open site, open reactive site. So the, the, this doesn't have a direct visual cue unless you, you tag it with a fluorescent marker. So in this first system, we're, we're doing like compression for some amount of time. And then you have like a thiol reaction that happens and you can look at fluorescence intensity to get a sense of how many of these like sulfide bombs are broken. Um, and then they're actually able to use that um, to control stem cell growth. So this is uh, mesenchymal stem cell growth. Um, this is if you don't apply any force to the polymer, this is if you uh, apply force for uh, 30 minutes and then you do a separate growth step. This is using uh, acrylated fibronectin to make the connection between the disulfide and, and stem cell growth. So you can do like pretty, pretty cool functional things as well. You don't have to just do color change and color emission. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I was really interested, okay, still am really interested in using this as a way to understand glassy polymers better. And glassy polymers have this, or so this awkward material that's like stuck, not in equilibrium. So it's like always trying to find a more comfortable state, but it's like never gets there. Um, and so we're using the spar paran molecule. And uh, previously, uh, the group that I postdoc with had done torsion. Uh, we want to do a series of tension compression. And this is uh, partially to address that at, at the time, like a misconception in the field that you could only activate these molecules in tension. If you're like a polymer mechanics person or really a mechanics person, um, the way that we think about tension and compression is actually sort of like a rotated tensor stress state. Um, so I was pretty convinced that things should, should translate pretty well between tension and compression, and we want to show that experimentally. Um, so this is our, our typical experimental setup that we do. So we're doing uh, tension testing at the same time we're monitoring the fluorescence. So we do that exciting with a 532 nanometer laser. And then we filter out uh, the laser light and all the noise in the lab and just get the wavelength that we're interested in. And we get a, a full field image of our material. The thing that looks black is because that doesn't have the molecule in it. The thing on the right that's fluorescing is the, the glassy polymer with sparprint in there. And um, I'm gonna show a lot of stress strain curves. What I've learned over the last year is that I need to define stress and strain. Okay, so stress for us is mechanical stress. It's force normalized per unit area in this, all the tests I'm going to show. So it's how much are you pulling, but we need to normalize by area because uh, otherwise something much larger obviously gives you much more force than something that's tiny. Strain here is change in length over initial length. So it's how far are you pulling? So 
how hard is it to pull on the y axis and how far are you pulling on the x axis so um this is a pretty typical glassy polymer curve what you have is an initial linear elastic regime you go through this thing called yield where stuff starts flowing and then um you might be able to keep pulling. This is PMA at 90 degrees C, so you can keep pulling here. But if we were at room temperature, it would have broken before we even hit yield. Um, so our having this fire plan in there is at small enough percentages that it has no effect on the, the stress strain response. That's what the top curve is showing. On the bottom, we see the fluorescence response. So just PMA has no change um, as expected. And then what we typically see in glassy systems is that you get a response as you start going through yield. So once you get flowing of this polymer, you start to see uh, this molecule open up. And so it's helping us like understand what's going on in the material. So this is our uh, tension versus compression experiment. So tension on top, compression on the bottom. These are slightly different axes, but basically the shapes of the curves look very similar. Compression typically has higher stress associated with, so it's harder to, to push something than to pull something. Um, and it and it goes at slightly higher strains. Um, and the fluorescence uh, looks very similar for, for both tension and compression as well. We're doing this at three different strain rates. Um, I want to warm up the idea of strain rate here uh, because it's going to become important later. But um, basically, if you pull faster, that means you have a stronger polymer response, but it also tends to be more brittle because things don't have so much time to like slide and relax. So they just break instead. Um, and it also um, fluorescence means you'll have a actually less response. So even though the force is higher, you have a lot less time. Okay, so the, the comparison we're really trying to get at is tension versus compression. And so we analyze this data in terms of looking at when does yield happen? So what's that peak? And then when does the fluorescence start to kick up? So it, we're looking at actually a change in slope there. And what we found is that this fluorescence activation, which is the open symbols, always follows yield. So it's always happening after yield. And that also uh, tension is always happening before compression. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of ways, but I'm, I'm taking this peak point here. So it's the, the peak of the stress strain curve. That's actually a like a very subtle debated point, um, <laughs> but yes, okay. And then, um, so it looks here that compression happens after tension, but if we collapse this data down into thinking about um, what is the tension actually in the plane, so we're compressing this way, but if we look at what's happening in the plane of the material, we actually get the data to collapse down. So it's like, even though we're pushing, the molecules are feeling pulling uh, in the transverse direction. And, and it, that's right, because this uh, spar red is acting as a molecular level sensor. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Okay. So all of that data was on PMA or acrylic, which I mean, it's a nice material, it's transparent, people use it. It's good for fish tanks, but it's, it's never been my favorite. Uh, my favorite material is polycarbonate. Like probably who, anybody who's ever taken class from me knows because I like to share what my favorite material is. I don't, that's probably a strange thing. Okay, so polycarbonate is awesome. It is also transparent, not quite as transparent as acrylic, but it's a really tough polymer. So unlike PMA, where if I pull it at room temperature, it breaks, um, I, can, I can pull polycarbonate quite a lot before it fails. And I, from basically the first time I saw this fire brand thing, I thought we should put it in polycarbonate because polycarbonate is like a much better model glassy polymer and I can run tests at room temperature. That's nice as an experimentalist because I don't have reflections off of the window of my thermal chamber. Um, but it's, it's also nice because I don't have temperature dependence of this molecule opening and closing because temperature affects the kinetics of the molecule and I wanted to like get rid of that. So I, I had actually asked if we could do this while I was post docking, but they, they said no. But like five years later, finally had the right the right people um, to be able to do the synthesis because um, the, the previous experiment we were following somebody else's synthesis here we had to come up with our own okay this is my, one of my students who first presented this use this, use this video and I, I don't know I, I love it okay <laughs> okay so um we had to figure out how to make this polymer and there are 
on the one hand, it was like very straightforward. On the other hand, it was very challenging. So I'd be able to highlight a little bit about that. Um, and so the one that I think that's nice is we get to put different functionalities into our polymer. So um, this is actually a much easier to make molecule and not just because our collaborator sent it to us, but also because the separation is much simpler. So you get much higher yield uh, than in our, our previous version that we need to use for PMMA. Um, and so this is our mechanophore and we're uh, reacting it with bisphenol A polycarbonate, which is like your standard polycarbonate. Uh, the one first thing that's maybe hard about this is in when you do this commercially, you use phosgene, which is like a good way to kill a grad student. Um, but uh, you can use triphosgene, so that's like a relatively simple switch as long as you work in a hood. Um, and um, so it like on paper looks straightforward. And I would say even before we started, Jeff Coates predicted the exact problem we ended up having, um, which, well, this is our failed material where it doesn't change color which is that um, we want to grow polymer off of uh, the sides. So we want to react uh, polycarbonate right, with the spiroparan. Um, but what happens is that this molecule is switching between the spiroparan and, and merocyanine state. And we actually end up growing polymer off of uh, one of the open sites from that reaction. And so um, to control that, what we do is, well, we tried a bunch of things. We ended up doing that was successful was we basically um, limit the reaction by limiting um, how much phosgene there is. And so um, by using excess BPA relative to phosgene, we basically make only the most selective reaction happening. So it, it's preferential to grow the chain, this, this side chain thing that makes our marocyanine inactive or spiroparan inactive is like less favored. So we basically go really slowly, painfully, um, <laughs> And, and build our polymer chain that way. Okay. And then the, the second sort of fun challenge here was it turns out, uh, usually in, in uh, industry, you make polycarbonate through um, thermal cast, like by heating it up and then making a material. But if you do that, it'll mess with your um, mechanochemically active component here, because again, our molecules are temperature sensitive. So we had a solvent cast. So my, my student actually dug up like a 1960s Japanese patent that figured out how to like solve the solid cast without getting crystallinity in the polycarbonate. So that's that's what this setup is here. Pretty sure that's you know like just a metal ring, but it made things work. Um, just one step above duct tape, and and we're able to get like a functional material. And now we can run tests at room temperature. Uh, my student also upgraded our setup with nice shutters, um, but basically we get very similar behavior to what we saw in the in the uh, PMMA system, but now we're able to do it with polycarbonate, which is a much better material and much more useful from like a being damage resistant perspective. One thing that's really cool about these glassy systems is that um, if you trigger this, this color change, it actually stays. So the molecule itself will wanna reverse if you just put it in something that's like very compliant. But the the glassy matrix is actually like stuck in this in this open state, and it'll it'll stay there. It's actually a really cool study that's just out on on archive, like looking at how you can use uh, spiroparan to study residual stress in polymers, or like what the stress that gets locked into the polymer when you do processing, which is a, a huge concern for like fatigue and failure. So I'm going to show you a little bit about how we tried to use this molecule to understand um, sort of plasticity and fatigue in glassy polymers. Um, Okay, so we ran this uh, test at four different strain rates. So now we're doing four decades of strain rate. This is actually not a very rate sensitive polymer, which is one of the things I like about it. And so these four stress strain curves look almost identical. If you go faster, it's a little bit stiffer, a little bit stronger. If we look at the fluorescence change, we get the same thing we saw in the uh, PMA system, which is the slower you go, the more fluorescence you get as a function of strain. But if we flip this around and do this as a function of time, we can see here really that this is a question of kinetics. So our fastest test has the least amount of time, and but it, it actually right starts fluorescing well before all the other ones. So this is all at uh, room temperature and we're going slow enough that we shouldn't be like heating as we pull or something like that. Okay, 
This is the slide of my second favorite test after uniaxial pulling to failure. I like to do cyclic testing because you can really learn a lot about a material by loading it and unloading it. Uh, for example, if I stretch a rubber band, right, I can, I can load it and unload it lots of times and it should follow basically the same curve always I come, come back and forth. In glassy polymers, what you'll see is you have something called uh, plastic deformation or permanent deformation. So as you, as you load more times, either if you go to the same strain, your stress will decrease, or if you go to the same stress, you'll get further and further. And this is like part of how materials fail. And if I just pull, I really don't know anything about whether things were permanent or not. But if I unload, then I can figure out like, did I dissipate energy? Did I apply, accumulate permanent damage? Did I accumulate permanent stretch? So this is a, a test of three cycles uh, to the same strain. And then we go to a higher strain and then a higher strain. And so in terms of stress, we get this initial yield behavior and then what looks like kind of, kind of linear behavior on this plot. And in terms of fluorescence, overall, we see a buildup in the fluorescence response, but um, much less during these cycles than during the initial step to each cycle. We match that to a stress relaxation test. So in a stress relaxation test, you pull and then you, you hang out there. So you don't move anymore, but your stress will tend to decrease, which is why we call it relaxation. So it takes less force to keep holding at the same strain or at the same displacement. And we ran these two tests because we want to have two different loading histories that take the same amount of time. So we match the time for the stress relaxation test to the cyclic. Uh, if we just look at them separately in the stress relaxation, we have an increase and then a gradual increase during the whole time. Right, this gradual increase during the whole time is itself kind of interesting because your stress is decreasing a lot, but still you have an increase in, in fluorescence. So there's some very cool time dependent things happening inside the structure. If we overlay the stress strain uh, plots of these two and monotonic it, it becomes very clear that overall the cyclic stress is like much lower on average than the stress relaxation because every time you're going back to zero stress. Uh, if we look at fluorescence, we see the cyclic actually has the strongest response. So even though it has less stress over time, it, the molecules on average feel like way more stress for Right, we're getting an aggregated fluorescence that says like, stop, stop shaking, shaking me, I'm, I'm upset, right? Like it's, it's, it's feeling much more than if I just like stay here and hang out, right? Probably like why roller coasters are more exciting than, not to me, I hate roller coasters. <laughs> more exciting than just, sit, just, just sitting at the top of the, right? Yeah. So energetically actually, when you, just relax that material. So they absorb from environmental energy or from they should because clearly they little uh electrons in a light, then actually they lost energy when applied stress. When relax, they could absorb the energy from somewhere. So there's um I'm going to separate out that question into like what's just happening mechanically and what's happening in terms of the of the like changing molecule. Yeah. So so when I pull on a polymer and then I hold it there, it's dissipating energy. That energy it's becoming it's no longer stored mechanically. It's becoming thermal energy. And we test samples that are small enough that it should be pretty easy for that thermal energy to go into the atmosphere. The in terms of the fluorescence, we're we're exciting that fluorescence with an excitation light. So um, oh, it's it's its own. Oh, this is not the light emitting system. Yeah. Not the same as we emit the light. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a little different. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's there's a group that did a similar, uh, totally different, but anyway, similar set of uh, very mechanics oriented uh, tests on the light emitting system that also has really cool findings. But I don't know. I've already, I'm sure, made way too many slides for the day. Um, yeah. Okay. So we wanted to um, try to have a cool paper and finish with a demo. Um, and one thing that um, that this material does is record history of really plastic deformation. I don't think I quite sold you on that, but history of the stress that's happened. And so what we did was we ran what's called a four-point bending test 
Uh, I like this test, not as much as tension testing, of course, uh, but because you get an area in the middle that's like a pure moment. And so you, you have a compressive strain on top, no strain in the middle and a tensile strain on the, on the bottom. So it's, it's kind of a cool um, gradient of strains that you have happen. Uh, we looked at this uh, test under using digital image correlation, which is a technique that you use to image strain fields. So it lets you know that you have compression on the top and tension on the bottom and how much you have. And then we also uh, used UV light to look at our mechanical flow response or to look at our, our equivalent of our fluorescence response from before. I'll just show movies first and then snapshots on the next. So uh, here's our digital image correlation showing strain contours and then our, our fluorescence. So if we look at the strain data, what we see is um, when we sort of load, we have lots of strain and then we, we look at our snapshot later and we've recovered. So um, I can see that something happened, but I don't really see how much happened. And so if you think about this, like I had an impact on my you know, window in my helicopter, right? I, I wanna know how much happened, okay? <laughs> So in our mechanophore system, we actually get as much intensity in the unloaded state as we had at the max state. So this, this keeps a record of like how bad things were. So that's why, why we're excited about it from an application perspective, um, in addition to the studying polymers mm -hmm. perspective. Okay. Let me ask this. Are metal coordination bonds the thing people are familiar with? I should just pre-ask Adrian stuff. So. Is this a familiar or unfamiliar? Okay. Also over many, all over many biology systems, but probably more on the on the animal side. Um, I'll I'll just talk about our work in this field, but um, this idea of metal coordination bonding to control materials uh, really started by studying mussels, not this kind anymore, uh, the type that's in the ocean. So. Uh, a muscle in the ocean have like really insane ability to dissipate energy because like there's an ocean and they're attached to a rock and they want to stay attached to the rock. Um, and so there's sort of two parts of that system, both actually involve metal coordination bonding. The first is this like really sticky goo that helps it uh, stay attached to the rock underwater. And the second is like, if my arm could stretch like a hundred times it's like then come all the way back over time, which I can't demo that because I'm not in fact Gumby. Um, that's, that's probably no one here knows Gumby either. All right. So um, there's both, both of those like dissipation mechanisms are enabled by um, biological metal coordination bonding. And then uh, material scientists were like, oh, hey, cool. We can like do something with that. Um, so I'm on that bandwagon. Uh, this is work uh, primarily done by my former graduate student, Joy Zhang. And um, we work uh, with uh, a group at Michigan that does some really cool spectroscopy and a marine science group at uh, Newcastle University. And uh, the little mini story I'm gonna tell about this is applying uh, this technique to PDMS or silicone. PDMS is used in a lot of applications, partially because it's easy to make, um, partially because it is uh, biocompatible. And so you'll see it in like microfluidic devices. You'll see it as a place that people like grow cells. And then also um, the world that I got involved with is this marine fouling release coating. So it's a pretty good uh, coating for, not really for stopping things from attaching, but for letting things be removed with relatively relative ease. Um, so in the like world of the Navy, um, right? If things grow on your boats, that's like a huge environmental impact and uh, fuel consumption and also like Spreading, spreading organisms ac across the ocean. So there's like a, I don't know, 30 plus year program it, it funded by uh, Office of Naval Research on how to have things either not attach or release easily. And so uh, PDMS has low surface energy, which is why it's used as a fouling release coating. Uh, it's also a problem because it tends to not adhere to substrate well, so actually getting it on as a coating is hard. And usually you have to do like an extra surface treatment uh, it has really high hydrophobicity, which leads to absorption of uh, various proteins. And, um, and this is uh, probably the thing that I'll focus on the most. It has this problem with surface reconstruction. So it's like really dynamic at room temperature and the polymer chains are always moving. 
And so people will try to like change the surface like by putting an oxidation coating on it. Uh, but but like 20 minutes later that, okay, maybe not 20 minutes, but on the scale of hours, that coating is gone because your surface actually reconstructed and new chains are on the top. So our idea was that we could um, manipulate the surface by manipulating the bulk. So instead of trying to just change the surface properties, we're just gonna change the properties everywhere and let the adapt actually use the adaptivity to help ourselves. And so the way uh, that we are doing this is by uh, hiding a polar functionality in the material. And specifically, I'll talk about our example of using metal coordination bonding. So um, I think of a metal coordination bond is somewhere between ionic and covalent. So there's a little bit of sharing, but basically it's it's a charged interaction. Um, and it, it's got like huge tunability, which is another uh, reason that it's kind of fun to work with. So it can be really as strong as covalent bonds and then like all the way pathetic, like dynamic, not, not lasting at all. Um, it's really environmentally sensitive. And so um, we were able to find some synthesis procedures and literature that we were able to use. So uh, basically what we do is we buy commercial PDMS, we buy short chains so that things are very flexible. And then we tack on what's called a ligand. And by tack, I mean, use uh, polymerization techniques or, or use a chemi chemistry technique, right? To uh, add that functionality onto the end. And now we have something that can bind the metal on both sides of a pretty short chain of uh, PDMS. And then we, we picked a metal center. So we have a divalent metal in the middle and it in general is going to wanna to interact with three of these polymer chain ends. And so we end up with a very dynamic network uh, where um, basically if and any one of these comes loose, then the chain is free to move. And this, this, is, uh, this is the polymer before the metal. You can see it's, it's quite not too viscous, very liquid. Uh, we also made a set up a control system where we, instead of putting just a uh, functionality on both sides, we use it to actually make the chains longer. So we end up with a much longer polymer chain and functionalities in the middle. So this is um, much, much less dynamic as a control, but it has the same amount of metal as our other system. So it's a good check of whether it's just metal content. And I will skip most things. I just want to show off. Um, our control system is like much stiffer than our dynamic system, um, which is all the way down here or blown up here. This is our dynamic system, very stretchy. This is our control system. And what we're able to do is actually control contact angle through time. And so with our more dynamic system, we start out hydrophobic, but our surface actually reconstructs. So it ends up hydrophilic in a way that's uh, fully reversible. And I'll show the movie version. So this is, this is tailoring through counter ions instead of through um, the metal, but basically you can see if we go with a really dynamic interaction, we get a, a really quick transformation. And if we go with a less dynamic interaction, we get almost no transformation, which we applied to uh, try to solve this fouling problem for which we are funded. We're funded, hopefully again. Um, and uh, this is where the um, Marine group came in. So they test, basically model organisms. One of these is a diatom and you let them um, grow on the settle and then grow on the polymer. And then you try to remove that using uh, shear stress in water. And then you see like how much is left. This is one of the organisms. The other one is Ovalinza, which is a soft macro feller. Um, so it's another model organism. And we see that uh, our system is actually pretty good at uh, helping facilitate foul release for diatoms and um, really not good at all for our oval um, So still some work to do, but I think I'll um, finish there. So please email me if you're interested in ELMI. Um, structure function relationships are awesome. And uh, that's my group and, and funding source. So thank you. Yeah. On, on your very last point, what is the difference between the diatoms and the other? I don't know biologically why, but I know why these are the two model organisms. Um, so diatoms tend to grow well on 
hydrophobic surfaces or stick well to hydrophobic surfaces, and oval lenses tend to stick well to hydrophilic surfaces. Our, our hope was that we would be creating a dynamic surface where like nothing would be happy, um, but, but we really just made the oval lens unhappy and the diatoms unhappy. So I guess we fell into a trap many people in this program before us have fallen into. So yeah, I don't, I don't know why, I don't have the biological understanding of why oval lens is like happy on hydrophilic. Yeah. That's a very nice talk. Thank you. So you showed um, both the EM seal information and also the special relaxation on what looks to be a very uh, homogeneous sample, I think, last time. Have you ever tried it on polymer combinations that have regions that are more elastic but also have a little bit more glassy? Yes, let's see. Actually, actually as, a, as a sub. Sub comment. I do think if you do um, like smaller scale microscopy on this, you would actually see inhomogeneities in that glassy. But um, one of the systems we've done this on is um, actually that's why I was post stocking. We put it into polyurethane, which has domains that are much more rigid and much soft. And we looked at the difference between how it responded if it was in the soft and the hard. And, and some other groups have done things like that. So yeah, you could definitely use it to help understand like stress distribution in different types of domains within a polymer. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Because I picked this to show, which I haven't presented in a while because I I think it'd be a cool way, and I think he's been thinking about that as well already post talk, like cool way to look at plants if we could figure out how to put this or an equivalent molecule into a biological concept. So there's cool. Yeah, I think I mean I think that would be awesome. Yes. It comes with lots of problems, but I think it's worth it if it makes any sense. Like you need to be very careful about interpreting uh, the results because of this time dependence aspect and the environment dependent aspect and the temperature dependent aspect, but still I think we can gain knowledge by doing it. Not the spiral pyrin that's converted into its active form. We are loading just in the elastic phase. Like would repeated loadings within that elastic phase result in an accumulation of the signal? Um yes, maybe. So if I define elastic phase in the I'll say like the way that we teach undergrads elastic phase, then yes. So um, in the place where it looks linear, um, if you go far enough along that point and just fold, it will eventually change color. And we, we, did, we did some of those experiments. Um, also, I guess that was when I was post docking. We ran what's called creep experiments, where you hold it at constant force. So even though you're like at linear elastic, you think you're linear elastic, you're not really linear elastic. So um, like in most glassy polymers, you actually always have some yielding happening or some plastic deformation happening. And so I do think there's like a not very detectable fraction of, of fluorescence that's happening even before we hit yield. And there's some like Taylor experiments you can run to sort of capture that regime. I do not think that you would see a response in the elastic, in like truly in an elastic regime here. And the reason is not really about force. Um, it's about like mobility or freedom of those molecules to like even find a space to change shape. So, but if I put these molecules into a rubber band like material, I don't, I have a, basically a different set of design rules. So I'm not sampling the lack of freedom or the lack of space in elastomer. I'm sampling like, do I have enough force? Yeah. Um, there's a, there's, okay. So some people think of it as force, like there is a critical force for this mechanical to react. But I, th I think that's a misconception. So what you really have is a sort of a form of a kinetics thing happening. So as you apply force, you are decreasing an energy barrier. And so your, your attempts, like you're basically your, your rate of converting goes up. And people have done really nice systematic studies on single polymer chains, like using that the molecule that has lots of mechanophores in it, and been able to really get at the rate dependence part of it. 
So it's you shouldn't you should think of it as a force accelerated reaction rather than a critical force threshold. Oh yeah, I'll send it to you later. Yeah. Ever worked that the polymers have changed over biologic time? In other words, how polymers have evolved as organisms have evolved. I mean, it's a general question. I'm thinking I, things like early life on Earth, stromatolites, or going up to something like a larger multicellular organism, podium, which is a big structure that puts up with wave action is a well to rocks and so forth. I mean, kind of yeah. context do you do? I, I have not. I think that would be really interesting. Um, the way that I, up until let's say a year ago, the way that I've interacted with biology is by like stumbling into mechanics people's talks about that involve biology or inspired by biology. Um, so this this is definitely this is a new a new move for me where I'm like actually trying to to learn. Um, but yeah. Started in the sea and yeah. Moved around what they answered. Yeah, I. I think one um, maybe along those lines, like one one thing that's interesting about this this metal coordination bonding concept is most of those organisms actually are sea based organisms. So I talked about the the muscle thistle threads. There's also uh, like a really awesome worm jaw thing where it like has goes from very compliant to like insanely stiff by uh, concentration of different types of metal cations and also uh, structural organization. So, and I do think, like, why are they using metal cations? It's because they're in a marine environment and that's something they have access to. So I do think it would be really interesting. I just, I haven't done it yet, but <laughs> I think that would be like a cool perspective to take on it. Or a really, really cool review for, for coming up. Thanks. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.